It's a pleasure uh, for me to introduce our two speakers this morning. Um, when you teach science or work in the field of science, you realize uh, how difficult it is in many respects. It's much more difficult if you're just a woman to get into those spaces as well. And it's certainly much more different than when you get there and, and everyone looks like me and it's like some old white guy and it's not reflective of even of the diversity of our country. So we have to continue to figure out ways to reinvent uh, the science community in the United States. Young adults who are like in this room, welcome, thanks for coming out, are going to have it far more difficult than we are uh, learning to innovate, to change the economy, to address climate change, uh, regardless of what fields they may eventually want to study, accounting, acting, it doesn't matter. They will all have to have a lot more knowledge of science than even we do. And then getting to that point is part of what we're trying to do with so many programs here at the Ethical Society, is to ensure that we're meeting our ethical obligation of preparing the next generation for what will be some of the keystone ethical issues of their generation. So I'd like to introduce two young women here who will talk about all the kind of uh, things that they had to navigate to end up into degrees in science. First we have Adriana Morocho. I think I've known you, I don't know when I first met you, how old were you? Ten, five, something like that. <laughs> 15 years old when I first worked with her. I showed up, I think, at uh, an event that you had in New Jersey at the Science Center right there. And she was in charge of everything and this huge group. I think there were about 150 of us that day or something like that, can't remember. She's an environmental science professional with experience in contaminated site cleanups. Since high school, Adriana began to get involved in nonprofit environmental work, leading up teams of young adults working on environmental projects um, on, and won the Union County Board of Chosen Freeholders Local Environmental Hero Award. This passion continued through college where she completed a Bachelor of Science in Applied Environmental Science. While in college, she also aided scientific research, which led to some unforgettable experiences traveling, which I hope maybe you'll share. She is currently a remedial project manager at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And then we have Tatiana Castro, who moved to New Jersey from Cali, Colombia when she was eight years old and she quickly learned English but realized that there was a coexistence with natural ingrained in Colombian culture that was missing in her new life in the U.S. That's when Tatiana knew she wanted to be a sustainable bridge between where we are now and where we want to be. She graduated from Monmouth University in 2016 with a bachelor's degree in marine and environmental biology and policy, and has worked for the Nature Conservancy, and most recently as the restoration field coordinator for the Billion Oyster Project. And I'd like to call up Adriana and Tatiana. Good morning, everyone. We're very happy to be here with you today, sharing some of our experiences as women who have worked in the field um, of science for some time now. Um, so I'm Adriana, and this is Tatiana. Good morning. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to be here and to be able to talk to you all and to everyone on Zoom uh, about our experiences where we come from, what, what we've been through, and where we are today. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So I guess I'll be the first one here. I was actually also born in Ecuador, and I came to the United States when I was 10 years old, and I hated it. Uh, I was used to the um, 
living in an environment where there was a lot of nature and we went to Elizabeth, right next to Newark, New Jersey, there wasn't a lot of nature and a lot of litter. And of course, there was also a culture shock for me. Um, it took me a few years to get used to, so I spent a lot of time watching documentaries about climate change and environmental documentaries and Discovery Channel. Uh, so that's kind of what sparked my interest in the environment. And uh, eventually I ended up joining an environmental club in my high school, which is kind of what led me down to this path of science, specifically environmental science. Um, so so I, I ended up graduating from Rutgers University in 2016 as well uh, in environmental science and have been working in, in this field ever since. Um, so just wanted to share with you a little bit of my passions in case, in case some of you can relate. Uh, I'm really into waste management and resource conservation, so everything that comes into recycling, um, even though it's not very good at times. Um, I also um, enjoy cleaning things, which is kind of related to my current job, um, which is cleaning polluted sites, being groundwater or soil that affect people and the environment. Um, environmental education, kind of what we're doing here today. I love animal welfare and so doing a lot of home DIY projects. I, I love that. Um, so after high school, um, I graduated uh, while in, in college. Um, let, let me st take a step back, actually. While in high school, they, there was this program that also got me into research. One summer during high school, I attended um, a program in Rutgers, Newark, which was related to um, insects. And most people don't find that very appetizing. <laughs> but uh, what I happened to learn during that time was the importance of aquatic invertebrates, so um, insects like dragonflies, damselflies, um, mayflies. Thank you. Um, what's happening? Oh, here it is. And uh, that it got me, by the time I reached college, I happened to meet one of the professors uh, which you see here, Dr. Jessica Ware, in the in the train station. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Put it a little bit lower. If you put it a little bit lower, then you may actually. Thank you. Sorry about that. There you go. Not at all. Okay. Um, so I met Dr. Jessica Ware again at a train station randomly, and she invited me to her lab. Um, as a professor at Rutgers, she has she was in charge of the lab, and the entomology lab. Entomology means insects, and um, she had a, quite a few research graduate students who were doing research of their own. So, I started to volunteer there through some programs through Rutgers. I actually got a chance to get paid through some of that work that I did. So we were doing research on a certain kind of family of dragonflies in South America. And that experience, thankfully, <laughs> led me to visit Colombia and collect some dragonflies and damselfly specimens as part of this research. And so I, this one of the pictures you see right here where I'm on top of a mountain, uh, very beautiful place, bordered to Colombia. Um, we also, also went on the river to catch some dragonflies and damselflies. I almost got decapitated here <laughs> because we almost hit a tree. Thankfully, that didn't happen. Uh, we were very close to being <laughs> it was It was bad. <laughs> but all these experiences were really fun, and I really encourage any of the young people and everyone, really, if you can participate in some sort of research or conservation project to do it. It's amazing. It's it's life changing because it, it puts it, it takes you to places you may never encounter in your normal life, and you get to meet amazing people. Um, so as part of this project, I also did some lab work. It, here's the first picture. You actually me at the Museum of National History in uh, Natural History. I'm sorry, in New York City, 
and uh, we were using a very, very expensive microscope that actually shoots gold particles into whatever you put there. And shooting that gold particles onto, um, in this case, was a part of a, a dragonfly, makes you, allows you to see very high quality images of that, or whatever you put in there. Uh, and, and it is just amazing. Um, so that was part of my research at Rutgers. Going back a little bit, this is where um, I met Kurt actually. That was through my work through Groundwork and it, Tatiana was also part of that. And uh, what we did there, we did a lot of conservation work. I got a chance to do some um, trail maintenance and other projects at Yellowstone National Park. So amazing that I got to go there for free basically. I just had to spare some of my hours and do some very much needed conservation work uh, at the National Park, uh, which is a beautiful place to go. You get a chance. I've got a chance to um, deal with um, young people adults uh, of all ages. <laughs> I got to do projects, environmental work. I do. I did a lot of river cleanups because I love picking up garbage from the streets. <laughs> I really do. Uh, I hate to see dirty streets. Um, I got to represent Elizabeth in a, in a conference in West Virginia. Um, and it's just, just an opportunity that, again, I want to emphasize to all the young people and, and anyone really who gets a chance to just go for whatever opportunity you can. If, if opportunity presents to you, go for it. Uh, make it happen, because that could, could change your life. And lastly, that's kind of what I'm currently doing right now. So this is when I worked as a contractor to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, so for those who may not be familiar, there's a lot of contaminated soil and groundwater and uh, in a lot of areas in New Jersey and New York, really everywhere, but we have a high concentration of those contaminated uh, areas here where we live due to past industries um, such as um, uh, the, the car industry or uh, there's so many things. I can't even think <laughs> of anything right now, but you know it. We all have seen it. Chemicals and plastic industry, all kinds of industry that have contaminated our water, have contaminated our groundwater, sometimes our drinking water. So for our safety, uh, for the safety for the health of the environment, we do cleanups. And currently, that's what I do. I just have to I have contractors, and I work with them, and uh, we look at ways that we can hopefully remove that pollution from the, uh, from the area and make it a better environment for people to live in. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Tatiana. Um, hi everyone. Alrighty, so my name is Tatiana Castro. I was born and raised in Cali, Colombia, and I came here when I was eight years old with my mom and my brother. Um, while I was living in Colombia, I took it for granted how easily it was to just have access to nature. You know, you just go to the park or climb on trees or, you know, run, run on grass and run around with your friends. And being outside was just so part of my day-to-day -day business that I never realized how that's not the case for everyone until I came to this country and my day-to-day -day no longer, um, it was no longer composed of being outside and chasing birds or climbing on trees. It was more of me being indoors um, and with a lot of TV time and a lot of screen time. And so I missed that part of my life in Colombia. Um, and I realized that it was affecting me a lot because every time I was, I went to the park with my family, it was just like, it just felt like I was a little bit more connected back to home. Um, and so I think from there kind of stemmed my interest in like what's the difference like where what's happening why is it different here than it was back home and uh, my grandmother was a huge influencer in my life um, and what I chose to like what I chose to pursue um, she always believed that uh, it was our responsibility to 
um, speak for those who don't have a voice. And in this case, it was for Mother Nature and for animals. Um, and so she always raised me with that mentality of like being that voice for them and, and, and protecting whatever we can, whatever was in our power to do so. Um, and so I think that that was a big factor as to why I decided to go into marine biology when I went to college. Um, originally, I didn't know specifically what I wanted to do. I just know I wanted to do science. I just, I like being in the lab. I like experiments. I like science. I like nature. I just want to do science. And then when I started researching colleges, um, I was like, what sounds the most exciting to me? Like, what am I really going to enjoy doing for four years? Um, and then that's when I realized a marine biology was probably what I would want to really like do because it, 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 it sounded fun to me. Right. And so I was always told do what you love and then it'll never be, it'll never feel like work. Right. I, I, it changes once you get a little older, but it, the root of it is true. Um, so once I was in, um, in college, I, I also minored in psychology. And um, just because, again, it was something that was interesting to me. Um, it had nothing to do with marine bio, but I was just like, psychology sounds cool. Why not? So I decided to minor in it. Um, and because of it, actually, um, it led me to being able to study abroad. Um, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But um, I am very passionate about environmental prote protection, social justice, and Latino representation in the scientific community, um, environmental education. And I, again, as Kurt um, pre uh, mentioned previously, I aspire to be the bridge between humans and healthy marine ecosystems. Uh, next. Uh -huh. All right, so a little bit of my background, as you guys can see, that's Adriana and I with one of our um, high school friends. Um, during, uh, and I know that this presentation um, was also uh, meant to be presented for, to a lot of the high school students, which is why I felt like I wanted to kind of give a background and start from the beginning to kind of trace a little bit of an image of what it took to get here um, and something that was relevant to maybe th the things that they were experiencing in high school or that they're expecting uh, to uh, see once they reach high school. Um, so I was part of the environmental club. I was also part of the marching band, uh, soccer, uh, swimming, cheerleading, and I was inducted into the National Honor Society because of my grades. And what I, I mean to um, communicate with this is that I was very active. I was constantly doing something. And so that led me to make a lot of connections with people, meet a lot of people, and also become more comfortable talking to people about anything and everything and just um, getting out there and becoming more confident in myself no matter what I was doing. I wasn't Ex like I wasn't excellent at any of this. I wasn't excellent at cheerleading or swimming or soccer, but I was good enough to be there. And that gave me the confidence to be like, I can do anything I want to if I really want to do it. Why, and why am I doing it? Because it's fun, right? And also because when you're going to college, the more um, active that you are on doing things and the more that you have on your resume, the more interesting you look, right? So it's like, oh, you're able to handle all of that and still good grades? All right, have you done community service? Yes, I have. Are you involved in this? Yes, I am. And so kind of to try to check all of those things off and having fun doing it um, was a big motivator as to why I was continuously involved in, in my high school. Uh, once I got to college, uh, I worked as um, uh, in the mail room. I worked all sorts of odd jobs in college because, you know, like we, we have to make it work somehow. Um, and I, I do want to mention that the only reason why I was able to attend college was because of uh, at the EOF program or the Educational Opportunity Fund uh, that I was very fortunate to be able to um, get granted because of my grades, because of um, how of what I did during high school and because of my GPA, um, I was able to uh, get a lot of help um, to attend college. I was able to attend Monmouth University, which is a private university, and private universities are very expensive. And so the only reason why I was able to go to college is because of this fund, because somebody believed in the work that I could do. So they believed in me, and they believed that I would be able to do something um, good in college. And so I took full advantage of that. Um, but they only pay for school. They don't pay for me to like survive day to day and my food and my, um, you know, books or stuff like that. So I, I definitely had to have multiple jobs in between. Uh, I worked as a waitress to uh, buy a car so I can commute back home um, and to be able to study, uh, to pay for my study abroad experience. Uh, so I, it was definitely a lot of work. 
um, education and also a lot of saving. Um, I also became a founder of the Gamma Beta chapter uh, of Chi Upsilon Sigma Latin sorority. Uh, there, was, uh, there was very minimal uh, la Latino representation at my school. Um, and so I felt like also that was missing and that's something that I could bring to the university. Um, and so for about four years, we fought really, really hard to bring a Latin sorority to our school to allow women in at that university to feel like they had a home away from home and to give them something to be excited about and people to connect with that understood where they came from. Um, and that, you know, just people that they could really like identify with and, and use each other to build up and to learn from one another. Um, uh, while I was in college, I also had the opportunity to become scuba certified. <laughs> Short people. <laughs> this is the only thing that men are good for is being <laughs> Short people problems. <laughs> um, I had the opportunity to become scuba, um, scuba certified. So I, anytime I travel, I try to make that like a, a destination or something where I have the opportunity to scuba dive because I love it and it's a whole new world. Um, so whoever wants to get scuba certified, I definitely uh, advise it. Um, and that I also uh, became boat safety certified, which allows me to drive boats in New Jersey and New York. Um, uh, while I was in college, I also did internships uh, because, again, once we graduate college, we want to be able to get hired. And we can only get hired if we have work experience or if we have some sort of, uh, I guess, something on our resume that tells them, like, hey, this is really wanna, what I want to do. I'm able to balance school, work, and internships. Um, and this is what I learned during my time in college. I didn't just, like, party and like go out and uh, focus on my grades like I put in the work right and that's something that we want to illustrate uh, while we're in college so that we can get hired afterwards uh, because I was able to go to college I was able to also see the world um, because through my university I was able to join a study abroad program which allowed me to study in Italy and Florence to be exact uh, for uh, for four months and while I was there I got to meet all different countries in Europe so I was able to travel to Greece to Germany um, to France um, and so I did a lot of traveling and a lot of like getting to know me and what I really wanted and what was important to me um, I also did a service trip to Guatemala, and for research, I went to the Bahamas to study mangroves and Cuban dogfish and um, manta rays. Um, so I, I guess through this, I want to express to um, high school students that as long as you do something that you want to enjoy, that you have fun and enjoy, it's going to lead you to do more things that you love and enjoy. So when I went to school for marine science, I didn't expect me to go to Guatemala to go and paint an orphanage um, and to go and, and provide services for people with diabetes. They're not correlated at all, but I found like it, opportunities find you when you start doing things that you love um, and things just kind of line up for you. And I never pictured myself going to Guatemala to do that, but I had the opportunity to do that. I never thought that I would have traveled to Italy to go and, and volunteer at a food pantry. Um, and even though I wasn't able to communicate with the people there because uh, they spoke Italian and I spoke English and Spanish and I could kind of throw some Spanish in there and I could understand and they could not understand me, but I kind of understood them. Um, <laughs> It gave me an opportunity to give back, even though that's not originally what it's there for, but you create those opportunities for yourself and they come to you as long as you open those doors and are willing to get out there and be adventurous. Um, after college, I continued waitressing until I found a job at a pharmaceutical company, um, which again had nothing to do with science, but I was like, these loans have to get paid because I still had to take out loans. So I was like, you know, unfortunately, my, my I don't come from money, um, so I, don't, I didn't have the opportunity to be like, you know, my parents can help me out with my student loans or with college expenses. We, we just didn't have it. Um, so, you know, I had to take matters to my own hands, and it's like, okay, well, after six months, that's the only grace period that you get to pay off your loans. Um, so I started working for a pharmaceutical company. Um, it was paying me really well, and the benefits were great, but it wasn't making me happy. And so I continued to look around and I landed a job at the Nature Conservancy for only six months. It was a temporary position. It was definitely me like kind of like taking a leap of faith because I'm like, okay, what's going to happen after these eight months? Do I stay with something that's so solid and that I know is paying me well or do I follow something that I know would make me happy and that's exciting, but that's not secure. So I decided to take that leap. And because of that, I was um, able to get to know people 
at the Billing Oyster Projects, who then, when an opposition, a position opened up four months later, they were like, hey, we kind of want you, like, you should apply for this position. And had I not taken yeah. that decision to, you know, invest in myself for six months and take a leap and get to know people, then I wouldn't have had the opportunity to work for the Billing Oyster Projects, which, if you guys don't know what that organization is, is an environmental nonprofit uh, that focuses on oyster restoration in the New York Harbor. Um, and so oysters are super important, and I advise you all to go and look into oysters. They're, like, super cool. Um, <laughs> they look like they're not cool, but they're really cool. <laughs> Um, and I got to work for them for three and a half years. Um, and so, so that was, that's been kind of my experience um, since. Um, while I was working for the Bill and Oyster Project, I was able to work with critters such as um, crabs and oyster toadfish, seahorses, eels, um, blackfish, and blennies. And I saw all sorts of um, creatures that are right here in, in the harbor, right between New York and New Jersey. It's the same water. They're all there. Uh, we just don't see them, right? Because we think the water is so dirty and uh, you can't touch it and uh, you can't swim in it. Mostly in New York, the people would go crazy before they set foot into the water because they're like, oh, it's contaminated. And yes, it, it can be after a rain event, but unless we get people out into the water and getting them to care, um, then and no one's ever gonna do anything, right? So it's gonna continue to be contaminated until people start saying like, I actually wanna go in that water. Like, we have to do something about this, right? And so, um, that allowed me to get really, really comfortable with that. At the moment, I'm undergoing a career change, and I'm actually going to computer science, um, and I'm, I'm working to become a software developer. Um, and so that's kind of like, whoa, you go from one science to the other. Yep, because I can still do it, and because I'm young, and <laughs> why not? Why not take everything on that I can if that's what I really want to do? And so, I'm, again, I'm taking a leap of faith, and I'm trusting myself, and I'm believing in me. Um, into going into something that I had never done before. I was really like completely computer illiterate. Like I knew how to turn on the computer and turn it off. And I knew how to put a presentation together and turn the computer back off. And now I'm actually learning how to create web pages and how to make them interactive. And I'm doing all of these really, really cool stuff. Um, but I was only able to do that because while I was um, working, um, I was able to save up money um, and I was putting half of my paycheck to save up for a house. I was thinking, I had a goal of going to save for a house, and then my plans changed, and I was like, actually, I don't wanna go buy a house anymore. Actually, I think I wanna become a software engineer. And so that, that money that I used to pay for a house, I'm reinvesting it in myself um, and into my education. So it's a scary, it is so scary. It is so scary because you're kind of living off of your savings, you know, and you, you, you don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know if it's gonna work out. You don't know if you're gonna be successful, but I do know that I've been able to overcome anything that I've set my mind to, and I trust in my ability to accomplish whatever I want. And so if this is what I, cho I choose to do, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do my absolute best, and it's gonna work out in my favor because I'm not gonna take no for an answer, right? So, <laughs> um, I am also currently a salsa instructor. Um, <laughs> so, completely off topic. Uh, I am a performer and a competitor, and I teach at a school in Manhattan. So if anybody's ever interested in learning salsa, uh, come to New York. <laughs> um, and this is where uh, Adrian and I, uh, we, uh, we met back in high school, um, actually. So we go way back, right? Um, so we played soccer together. We were part of the National Honor Society together. And we do like we did like beach cleanups, and we we're part of the uh, yeah like we did so many things together in high school, and we had no idea that years later we would be presenting to people about what we experienced and how we grew up and stuff. So just wanted to share that with you guys because we thought it was cool, um, and yeah, and now uh, we just kind of want to touch on a couple of topics. So I'll leave you back to Adri, and yeah. Yeah. So one of the when we were discussing this with Kurt, um, he brought up some ideas of what kind of things some people may be interested in, in hearing. So one of them was what let you two decide to study science. So I kind of mentioned earlier that for me it was being stuck at home after moving to the United States and not having a lot of nature around me and watching a lot of documentaries about climate change and this um, habitat destruction that led me into this path of getting involved into all science things. I, I pretty much see a science um, opportunity and I jump to it to this day. <laughs> um, so for me, it really was that the impact it had on me seeing the habitat destruction that our day-to-day -day lives 
um, have. Um, for example, um, we all think about the, the industries uh, that pollute and contaminate, but they're polluting and contaminating for us because we are consumers and we're consuming those products that they're generated. We have cars, we have, we're using plastic, and those all for our well-being or our convenience, really. Um, so that is why I decided to study science. Sorry, I'm, we're trying to like like work with the microphones here, so we're going back and forth between turning them on and turning them off. Uh, I decided to um, study science because, as I mentioned previously, it was something that was influenced to me by my grandmother, um, and it was just something that I was really, really excited about. Um, so uh, I, I love it till this day, and I will continue to love it until I think the day I die. So it's just going to be something that's just going to be part of my life no matter what I do. now okay <laughs> so next question what did our family or friends think about this um, all right my mom was not thrilled when I told her I was uh, doing environmental science in college she really wanted me to do like a lawyer and she kept telling me that until almost a year before I graduated college <laughs> but then she saw me traveling in Latin par parents do not like kids leaving the house uh, so that was, I mean, I literally, to attend the program I did during high school for the summer, I had to cry my eyes out <laughs> till they can let me go. And in college, same thing, I had to cry my eyes out so my parents would let me go. And honestly, that's the best thing the parents can do, especially when the kids are going to do something that is going to benefit them, even if, if it's not immediately in the future, or it can benefit the community because some you just gotta leave the nest to do well for the the world, and um, m my mom still mentions it from time to time. Oh, you should have been a lawyer. But then she sees, <laughs> but then she sees that it makes me happy that um, I work with people, the community, and she, she she's okay with that now. And uh, you know, I I'm doing well for myself, I should say. So she she's definitely very happy about that. <laughs> Uh, okay, here we go. So uh, my family uh, was uh, was um, very supportive. Um, they're they're like super proud of of me and of what I have accomplished with marine biology. They were super like, let's do it. Like you got it. You you know no matter what you do, uh, we believe in you. And that's something that I'm super super grateful to have still now, even with this career switch. Like a lot of parents would probably be like, what are you doing? We just spent all this time in college, and now you're all of a sudden giving it up. Uh, but they're just like, no, like if, if that's what you want to do, do it. Um, so they were really, really supportive in that aspect. Um, the one thing that they were, they were very supportive um, mentally and emotionally, uh, financially, they couldn't, right? Um, they, we, we just, again, we just didn't have it. Um, and so that, that was on me um, to, to make it happen. Um, so that, I think that that was one of the things that um, was a, a huge barrier for me was um, the finances uh, because again like maybe if I didn't have to work while I was um, taking classes and maybe I would have been able to focus more on classes or more on internships or more on networking and getting to know people right um, and that's gonna go into my third advice but just um, finances could really can really be either detrimental or could really um, affect the way that somebody moves in certain spaces. I um, mean, I know I've been very privileged to be able to say that I went to college, that I had the opportunities that I've had, that I've traveled the world. Um, but it has been, um, it's, it definitely is challenging um, and it continues to be a challenge. Uh, so I, I would say that that's probably one of the biggest barriers for me has been economically uh, making it happen. All right, last one. Uh, what advice would you offer other young women, especially Latinas, uh, to help them succeed? Uh, and also, what would you have done differently? I guess I want to start on that one. Um, I think I would have try tried to cry a little harder so my parents would have <laughs> let me go study abroad. Uh, I think that would have been a life-changing experience. After I started working professionally, I traveled a lot. I mean, I was out for months. And it was great. So thankfully, after that, my parents let me leave the nest. Uh, but yeah, that would have I would recommend anyone as Tati would probably study abroad if you can. <laughs>
um, what advice would you offer? Uh, I say jump at every single opportunity you can. Obviously, also be picky, but if you can attend, I think the biggest life advantage that I've had has been that I attend places I go, I show up, and usually show up on time. That's very important. Um, be there sometimes, even just getting to know professors that can lead to opportunities, getting to know teachers, getting to, you see a flyer of an event happening, mm, what is this, Th uh, that sounds a little interesting, maybe not, but go check it out. Um, sometimes there's grants that could lead you to travel somewhere and, uh, and that may very well lead you to a completely new career path. Um, so really is show up, show up on time and attend all events as soon as you can. L doesn't matter how young you are, you think, oh, I'm still in high school, but there's this event happening, go. Your first year of college, start from there. Don't, don't wait till your last day, your, your last year of college to start getting internships or, or start getting involved. Get involved as soon as you can. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, I'm having a little bit of trouble with the Zoom, um, like sharing uh, the screen. He's actually turning it off so you can see your face. And oh, I keep, oh, that's what's happening. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, David. <laughs> I keep like, I'm like, why do you keep kicking me out of the screen? <laughs> um, uh, and so I think... Um, I'll start with the, with the first part of the question. What advice would you offer other young women, especially Latinas, to help them succeed? Um, this one's probably going to um, maybe be a little biased uh, because of my background and because what I now, um, what are my struggles now as a 28-year-old um, and what have been my struggles this entire time? Um, become financially literate. So find out how finances affect your life because, again, my parents didn't really have that much money, um, they were just making it. You know, they were just getting by. And so uh, have becoming financially liter literate didn't, wasn't really a, like a luxury that they could be like, oh, I'm gonna go and invest into this and invest into that, or I'm gonna put money on my savings here and my savings there, right? Um, but I had that luxury to do that. And I, I have the privilege to be able to sit back and be like, you know what? I have a home, I have you know food, and I have shel a, sh a shelter over my head. Like, let me figure out my finances now so that later on in the future, I can, I, I, I don't have to miss out on an opportunity because of finances and because of money. And when I say finances, I don't mean like, you know, opening up all these credit cards and like, no, just, you know, saving money and putting money on the side and um, how much are you spending and what, what are you saving for? Is there a trip that you might want to go to or is there something that you want to buy for yourself? Start budgeting and start um, becoming more financially literate because a lot of um, Latino households don't have that didn't have that luxury to to understand what a, you know to to really understand that and so i think it's up to us to to realize that money doesn't grow on trees and that we it doesn't matter how much you make what matters is how you're managing your money so you could be making a lot of money but if you're mismanaging mismanaging it it's not going to mean anything you're still going to be in debt you're still going to be paying off your student loans so many years down the road and you don't want to live that way because you want to be able to full like live life fully right so become financially literate um and definitely go picking back up uh, taking a piggyback off what adriana just said say yes say yes to everything say yes even if you have to wake up early on a sunday to go do something <laughs> do it because it'll be rewarding and it'll pay off and maybe you'll, you'll connect with somebody or you'll be able to be reminded of what you did to get to where you are today. Like that's what's happening to me now. It's like this presentation allowed me to reflect on everything that I've been through to get here and that it doesn't matter if right now it, things are uncertain. I got this, right? So keep pushing, say yes to everything and, and give yourself the opportunity to live and to experience things because experience is really all you're gonna have left. Uh, money comes and goes, uh, friends come and go, but the things that you put yourself through and the experiences as you live today are going to continue to shape you for the rest of your life. That's it. Fantastic, yeah. We have time for just a couple of questions. If someone in the audience 
y uh, preguntas en español también. So if anyone wants to ask anything, uh, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. You both are very impressive and just wonderful. So thank you for coming this morning. I have a master's in science in speech pathology, and it's a very scientific, it was a very scientific program. And it's a second career for me. So uh, somebody said, doesn't matter how old, how old you are, young you are, it doesn't matter how old you are either. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was in high school and junior high in the 70s, I didn't understand too much of math or science, and I was told, uh, you know, girls don't really get it, don't worry about it, you like to read, do English. And then I got into this program, and it was hard, but all you had to do was read and do the effort and figure it out, and I would like to say that that is also part of it, putting in the effort, you, you get the benefits from it. And Adriana, you were talking about your parents and family kind of being naysayers. Did either of you have any other, other than the family, have any naysayers as you were growing up? Um, um, I, one of, actually, my, uh, my college advisor um, I originally wanted to pursue veterinary school. Um, I, I got, you know, I, that's something that I had always thought from when I was little. I was like, I want to go to veterinary school. I, and when I went to him and I was like, hey, this is what I have. He was like, eh, I don't, I don't think you have it. Like, you know, it's just maybe you should try something else. Maybe find something else. And so that to me was, it was a very, um, it was very influential because, because of him, um, at that moment, because I thought he knew best and because he was my advisor, he was an adult, he lived life, he knew science, he, you know, he, he, he was the person that I was looking up to. And if that person told me, I don't think you have it, you should probably pursue something else, I believed him. And I don't know, maybe one day I will pursue veterinary school. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> maybe I will. Uh, um, <laughs> you're never too old. And if I, and if at any point in my life I realize that that's still a passion that I want to pursue, maybe I will. But at that moment, it did shape my decision and it, and it did have an effect on the decisions that I made moving forward. Do I regret becoming, you know, a, a marine biologist? Do I regret? No, I don't. I don't because it has been very fulfilling and it's my life and I'm still living it and on my own terms. But it does, it, your words do have an effect on people. Um, so don't think that just because it's like, oh, I just gave you my opinion. She didn't have to listen. It's not, it's not always like that. Mostly when you have a position of power, like being someone's ad college advisor, right? So that was definitely uh, one person that I, it still, like scouts to this day <laughs> and to me really was mainly I would say my parents and not being supportive of usually me going away to seek opportunities um, but other than that I've had the luck uh, and the privilege to have very supportive mentors throughout my life through groundwork specifically I would should say um, they were all it was a very supportive community and they were very always encouraging and I was, I think it, you know, it really depends on who you are involved with, um, who your connections are. And since I've been very involved my whole life with anything science, I jump at those opportunities. I've had always very supportive uh, people around me who encourage me to follow um, any, anything that may come my way. Yeah. And how important it is to create opportunities like at Yellowstone and for us to continue to fund science things so that we can get young people out there and for them to experience science, yeah. Other questions in the room? If not, we're going to go online. Yes, ma'am. Just a suggestion. Uh, back in the 80s, I used to, um, I was in, first I was invited in, and then it just became a thing to speak in high schools to groups of um, mainly girls, although boys weren't prohibited from coming, on um, taking up a career in engineering. I was an engineer, and they, what you're saying today would be such a fabulous presentation in high schools to, the, to high school age kids. And 
I don't know. I was very fortunate that my company supported my doing this about once a month, going out for a couple of hours and um, doing one of these talks. If your employers support you in doing it, please. You know, <laughs> my son's a high school teacher, and he just um, he switched schools recently, but he had been in a school in Perth Amboy, and those kids would love. Uh, it would be wonderful for them to hear the kind of message that you're bringing. It's it, they would have loved it. And David, if we have any questions online. We do not have any questions on Zoom. Sounds like Tati and I are going on the road. Yeah. <laughs>